Every musician that ultimately has a career in music has one, two, three, four game-changing moments. And my first game-changer happened when I was at a community college on Long Island and I was a, a music student and when I was finishing up my second year I had a teacher who I looked up to. He was an arranging teacher and he said, hey, what are your plans after Nassau Community College? I said, hey, uh, I think I'd like to finish up my bachelor's degree. So he said, where are you going to go? I said, I don't really know. Uh, got any ideas? He said, yeah, you should go to the University of Miami in Florida. And I said, why should I go there? And he said, because that's where I went and they have a wonderful music program. So that's what I did. Followed my teacher's advice and um, I, at that point in my life, I, I was always a better drummer. It was my first instrument, but I always noodled on the piano. They allowed me to take a lot of jazz piano courses, and I was in an improv class, and I was one of maybe two or three piano players, but there were about 15 guitarists, and all but one of them played fat, hollow-bodied, Gibson ES-335 type guitars with all the treble off, you know. <laughs> But there was this one guy with long blonde hair and he played this beat up Telecaster body with four pickups and a Gibson neck or Stratocaster neck with Gibson frets. And he didn't sound like a jazzer, but he sounded like a one of a kind player. But the teacher who was trying to get everybody learning to be beboppers was yelling at him all the time. But one day he came up to me and he said, hey, I know you as a piano player, but somebody told me you play the drums. I said, yeah, actually. I'm more of a drummer than I am a piano player. Well, what do you got in mind? He said, well, my drummer just broke his arm surfing. Do you think you could fill in for him until he heals? I said, yeah, sure. Now, I didn't know what I was going to be walking into, but when I went to the first rehearsal, I thought I had died and gone to heaven because it was the Dixie Dregs and it was the exact same lineup as the Mahavishnu Orchestra, which at the time was really the only band I listened to. Billy Cobham was my idol. They had the electric violin with Jerry Goodman, John McLaughlin, Jan Hammer. Um, and uh, so they were playing Mahavishnu covers, and then Steve Morse's original music was in that same vein. So I couldn't believe what I walked into. And I ultimately ended up staying with it. And when we got out of college, we all looked at each other and said, hey, what are you doing for the rest of your life? I don't know, LA, New York, Nashville. We decided to go for it. You know, we're all 22 years old. We're these young musicians, idealistic, not realizing that, hey, we don't have a singer. Hey, you can't dance to our music. Disco was huge at the time. And we're just going to play our esoteric music. We'll shop for a record deal in New York, get a deal, and sell a million records. You know, it's good to be young. So. We moved outside of Augusta, Georgia, because that's where two of the guys lived, or three of the guys. And we got on this little circuit playing the Carolinas, Tennessee, Alabama, and uh, Georgia and Florida. And it's just like today. They pay you 100 bucks to drive two, three, four, five hundred 500 miles to play your gigs. And you know, you're setting up all your equipment and going through that painful ordeal. But you know, when, when you're on a mission to change the world, doesn't matter, you know? It's the most important thing. So one night that seemed like any other night, we're playing this club in Nashville, Tennessee called the Exit Inn. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the Dixie Dregs. We're gone and all of a sudden some of us notice a famous musician sitting at the bar. So we kick it into high gear and then when we finished the set, this famous musician came up to us freaking out going, who are you guys? Do you have a record deal? And it was Chuck Lavelle, the keyboard player from the Allman Brothers, who at that time in the mid-70s, they were, they were, if not the most famous band in America, they were one of the most famous bands. And um, it's because of him that we were signed to our first record deal. So that got us our first deal, and then that got us out of just playing the southeastern part of the United States. We were now sent out to play the entire United States. And so we found ourselves in LA when, when our first album was released, playing at the Roxy on Sunset Strip. You know, I've always, at that point, always dreamt about going out west, 
California, LA, and now I'm in, my, in a band getting ready to play Sunset Strip. Well, as if that wasn't enough, we were going to be the opening act for the Billy Cobham band. So I was both, you know, terrified but exhilarated to like be the opening act drummer for Billy Cobham. So we were doing two shows a night for two nights and at one of the shows we got on stage, we got comfortable. You can't see the audience because the Roxy has a curtain down and then as they announce you, you start playing and then the curtain slowly rises. Well, as the curtain slowly rose, there sitting in the first row was Jaco Pistorius, Stanley Clark, Lenny White, Michael Walden, John McLaughlin, and we were told later on that Jeff Beck or Joni Mitchell uh, also were somewhere back in the crowd. So you talk about the icons of the fusion movement, there they all were. So, you know, we did our show, we got to meet all of these people, shake their hands, talk to them, they had such nice things to say to us and, you know, wished us well. And then Billy did his set, and at the end of it, they all went on stage and jammed. So you had Randy Jackson, Stanley Clark, Jacob Pistorius, all playing bass, three basses, John McLaughlin with John Schofield, and then uh, Lenny White and Michael Walden were up there shaking tambourines, and uh, I happened to dig this piece of tambourine out of uh, you know, my, my drum chest, because I wanted to bring it to show. Um, I think it was Lenny White who was playing it, and it shattered, you know, he was having such a good time, and I grabbed for a piece of it so I could have it, you know, as a, as a memento to remember what for me was a, a game-changing moment in terms of me realizing that up until this point I was, you know, on the periphery of things, going to the concerts and seeing these people up there hoping someday I could maybe be in that company of people and all of a sudden there I was.